Hello everyone. In this unit, we're going to begin our discussion of hashing. To begin that, we're actually going to start at a higher level. We are going to begin by discussing what we call an abstract data type. In something like C++, this would be something that you would define as a template, and then you would extend this template into various different data structures. So this abstract data type is a dictionary. You should be familiar with this idea from your coding classes, whether those be the software series or some other sequence of coding classes you've taken. The idea here is that we are going to have a collection of key value pairs. The keys will map to some values. In Java, I believe this is called a map. Uh, different languages will call this different things. With that in mind, we're going to discuss primarily a couple of methods. We have an initialization method, which is like your default constructor. We have an insertion method, which will add something to the dictionary. We have a retrieval method, which will return the data associated with that key value pair. You'll give it a key and return a value. And we're gonna have a member function, which is like the previous retrieve function, but returns true or false, depending on whether or not that thing is in the dictionary. We're primarily going to be interested in hashing, and in particular, hash tables is going to be our implementation of this abstract data type. So let's move on to talking about hash tables. A hash table is an array that stores these key value pairs and has a hash function that will allow you to figure out where you go in this array. So the elements of this array are going to be a key and some data. And we know where those elements go by hashing the keys. We compute h of k. That gives us some value i. That value i is the location of that key in that array. Depending on the values for the keys, you can have different hash functions. However, as you may be well aware, every single data type within the computer must be stored somehow numerically, whether it be as just some arbitrary binary string or having some sort of more sophisticated way of converting some data type into an integer. So we'll primarily focus our attention on integers when talking about hash functions these functions that tell you where in the array the various things will go. So let's discuss a couple of implementations of hash functions and we'll discuss why they are good and why they are bad. Our first hash function we are going to discuss is going to be called modular or division hashing. This is a relatively straightforward implementation. If you noticed from our hash table we had up here, our values went from 0 to m minus 1. A very natural way to squish any integer down to that range would be to take the mod of that integer mod m. So our first implementation is going to be take the key and find its modulus mod m. Relatively straightforward. There are several potential problems that can arise, and we just have them uh, listed out here. The first problem is that if you have a hash table of size 1,000, pretty reasonable size, then we have this issue where... If I find 23 mod 1000, I get 23. If I find 1023 mod 1000, I get 23. If I find 2023 mod 1000, I get... Oh no, this is a problem. And this will happen for anything that ends in 23. So this is a serious problem, it looks like. There are some more problems which are even potentially worse, which if, is you may know some information about the keys that are going to be provided to you in a problem. So for example, it's possible that every single key that you have is even and that the size of the table is even, like a thousand. If this is the case and you have only even numbers and you're finding their modulus mod some other even number, you will only ever receive even numbers as a result. What that means is you will never access the odd portions of the hash table. Therefore, the hash table will be half full which is really not ideal. You just have these arbitrary spaces that you're reserving memory for in the array, but you are not able to use them in any meaningful way. Our next problem that occurs is if this goes even worse, and let's say that your M is a multiple of 10, and all of your keys are also multiples of 10, then every single computation will result in a multiple of 10, which means you're only using one-tenth of the elements of the table. So this is clearly a potential problem that we might need to contend with. One way to get around these last two problems is to always make m an, a prime number. So, for example, uh, for a very small table, you might choose m is equal to 13. A nice small prime number, and hopefully that would avoid some of the problems. 
However, more problems can still occur because values such as m plus 23 and m 2m plus 23 and 3m plus 23, all of these values would map to h of 23, which is really not ideal to have. We have this regular pattern incrementing by a fixed value m each time, and all of those map to the same thing. That seems like a serious problem. There are some other more sophisticated ways we could implement hashing. Let's discuss them relatively briefly here. One of those more sophisticated ways is what's called multiplicative hashing. This is not using a modulus, it's using a rounding down method. And if you look, we have, we're taking the value m, the size of the hash table, and multiplying it by the fractional part of sigma times k. I have this written out here as an example. We have the frac of this horrible decimal is just the fractional part, the part after the period. So this will guarantee to give us a number when, when we compute frac between 0 and 1. And it will, when we run that down, it will therefore definitely be between 0 and m minus 1. So this looks like it's relatively smart. We choose this value sigma to be between 0.5 and 1. That has some nice properties for us. We're not really going to get into those. Let's discuss some problems that happen. If we were to, to for example, choose sigma equals 7 eighths, let's say I chose k is equal to 8, then 7 eighths times 8 is 7, and the fractional part of 7 is 0. And let's say I chose k equals 16, then I would have that 7 eighths times 16 is 14, and again, the fractional part is 0. So both of those values would map to 0. And similarly, any multiple of 8 would map to 0. So here, you're only using 7 eighths of the table. I created another example with a similar thing where we've changed the denominator to 17, which seems like it might help, but then you're using 16 seventeenths of the table, and you're still wasting memory, which is not ideal. We want this thing to be a very efficient data structure. So one way around this is that you can make this approximate an irrational number. Irrational numbers are numbers which cannot be expressed as an integer divided by an integer, and that should therefore avoid this particular issue. One common choice is this thing that looks vaguely similar to something you may have seen with the golden ratio. This is radical 5 minus 1 over 2. An approximation of this value is this horrible looking fraction here. And now if you look, because of the gigantic denominator of that fraction, we have that there's no choice of k that would easily make this all map to zero. So this is one smart choice. This choice works very well when you're on a 32-bit machine. If you are on a 64-bit machine, you'd want to choose a more sophisticated approximation to avoid this issue as well. Our third form of hashing that we're going to talk about is going to be what's called universal hashing. This is actually a bit of an awkward term depending on who you ask. Universal hashing refers to one of two things, either this particular hash function or a property of hash functions. So here we're meaning it to mean this form for a hash function. Here what we are doing is we are t we're effectively doubling down on the modular implementation that we did before. We're going to take our key k and multiply it by some integer, then add by another integer. We're then going to find its mod p, where p is some massive prime number. After doing that, we take its mod m. So this value gives me a value between 0 and p minus 1. And then we take that value mod m, and therefore that would give me a value between 0 and m minus 1. So this again maps down to our correct range of values. The nice thing here is that this has the property that we would really want. So... We have this theorem. We aren't going to prove this theorem. We're really not going to use this particular hash function much in the class. We say if a and b are randomly chosen integers from the interval 1 to p minus 1, then the probability that any two keys, k1 and k2, have the same value from this hash function is 1 over m. This is as good as we could hope. The There are m locations in the array, and we want that 
we have a, a small of probabilities getting a overlap as possible. And 1 over m is the best we could possibly do. So, this is relatively good, but it only is true so long as we choose k1 and k2 less than some prime. If you know something about your data ahead of time, let's say it was student numbers, and you have an upper bound on what you use for your student numbers, then you can choose up any prime number larger than that, and this theorem should hold, as long as a and b are randomly chosen. So this seems like a very good idea. There are several, several, several different ways you can talk about hashing. You could spend an entire course talking about hash functions. We will not do that here.